Let me pray for us. Lord God, out here in this field, um, we seek you. Regardless of the week previous, we seek you. We show up because we need more of you, not more of Nate Stratman for earthly wisdom, but godly wisdom, supernatural strength and guidance. So God, may your spirit um, speak through me. May your spirit help us hear your word and what you want for us. And we pray it in the strong name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. amen. I am still devastated that I was not Coach Dorn's house, but I, uh, <laughs> I've told people about it too. <laughs> Steve told me. <laughs> um, I, I found it slightly devastating. I am a people pleaser. I, I found it slightly devastating when my mom informed me as a young kid that there was a mom of another kid who didn't like me. Um, and the reason why uh, Mrs. Brewer, you can look her up, didn't like me is because Nathan always had to be doing something, right? And so she wanted her kid just to sit in the house. But Nathan always wanted to be, like, doing stuff. And so now I get it. My mother, which maybe wasn't great parenting, I thought it was cool, but gave me a quarter to ride the city bus. And so we'd get on the city bus with our friends and then go downtown when we were young teenagers because we had a friend named Levi who owned a Chinese restaurant and we got free egg rolls. And, and then we just met all these random people uh, downtown. But Miss Brewer hated the fact that I always was coming up with adventures like that. But that was kind of how I was wired. And then I went off to college and I was the social chairman of this big fraternity, so I planned things and we went on big adventures. And then I became a youth pastor and that's really what you do with Jesus squeezed in there, but you do events and you do all these other things. But then I got to this point where I became envious of those people who were still, right? Those were the super spiritual people who uh, actually didn't do a whole bunch of stuff, but were still like they carried journals and they wrote in their journals and sometimes they lit candles when they prayed um, and they read people like Henry Nowen and Thomas Merton and all this kind of stuff. I'm like, wow, those are godly people. Uh, so I thought I would do what uh, any good extrovert would do is I would start going to a monastery in South Carolina uh, where most of the people took a vow of silence. If you can imagine that, I like to talk, and here I am with a bunch of monks who didn't like a person who liked to talk. And so I go down to this monastery, and I remember clearly getting the stink eye from one of the monks because I was kind of chatty. I was like, hey, what's this, what's this, and what time do we eat? And, you know, I'm just glad to be there. And, um, and then, you know, it's like, oh, it's lunchtime, cafeteria, you go there, and it's, oh, you sit at your, by your, you know, your own table, and you don't talk to anyone. I'm like, this is horrible, you know? But it's spiritual, you know, so I'm going to make sure and do that. Um, and eventually I real, realized something that is, was profound for me, that... Um, you can stop all the activity in your life uh, and still not be still before the Lord. I'm going to say that one more time. You could pull your kids out of every event. You could stop doing everything you do. You could sell your computer and all these kinds of things and get rid of your smartphone and still not be still before the Lord. And so as I've thought about my inner busy and my outer busy, some of y'all, you know, your heads are busy. My, our heads can get busy. Um, when I think about that, it has everything to do with how I see God and God sees me, I promise you, and we're going to unpack that today. We're going to look at Psalm 46, which I think speaks to this um, inner busy, outer busy, because it's the famous verse that says, be still and know that I'm God. But I think we take that out of context sometimes, and there's a lot of context in here that I want you to pay attention to that helps us understand, be still and know that I'm God. Sometimes we just tell people, be still, but if you're like me, you want to know why be still. And here's a great answer to it. So we're going to stand. We've been doing this in our psalm series. Stand as we read this. If you look in your bulletin, you're going to participate in reading it with me. Psalm 46, 1 through 11. Uh, I will read uh, the, uh, the first two, and then you read the bold, the three and the four. This is the word of God. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. Though the waters roar and foam, and the mountains quake with their surging, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall, he lifts his voice, the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us, the God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he has brought on the earth. 
he makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and he shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. For what it's worth, for you people that love hymns, uh, Martin Luther wrote, uh, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, based on that text that talks about God being a fortress. Now, if you all were to go home, which I'd love for you to do at some point, and read this psalm uh, after I preach on it, it is jam-packed, almost too jam-packed, with things uh, about God, about God's character that are really, really important. But here's kind of what I want to raise this morning is, uh, with my left hand, I'm, I'm going to say that the psalmist is helping us with a reality. And one of the things when you see that the psalmist is saying that God is a refuge and a protection and a fortress, that assumes that there's opposition and danger, right? If, you're, if he's saying that God protects me, then from what? And so the psalmist talks about trouble. And you just look right in the text that's in front of you. There's all kinds of trouble that the psalmist is talking about. Fast forward, New Testament. Jesus talks about trouble. He says, in this world, you're going to have it. I talk about that one all the time. It's one of the promises. There is trouble in this, in this life. And, and so the psalmist says this, and think about this kind of trouble, because some of you have relational trouble or whatever, but the psalmist says, the earth gives way, mountains fall into the sea and quake, and talks about the waters roaring and the water foaming. Why these troubles? Now think about these troubles. Most of them are natural. Uh, and they, they're completely out of control. Like you, as much as you want to stop a hurricane from coming to the coast of North Carolina, you can't do that. These kind of troubles are way out of uh, our hand. And so I want to say this as we talk about troubles, as Jesus talks about, as the psalmist always, David always talks about the hot mess he's in. It is not good to downplay our troubles. Sometimes Christians were like, God is good in my life. There's no trouble. If there's trouble in your life, then we're honest about the trouble that, that's happening, right? So in this context, the enemies are trying to sack Jerusalem. That's what's happening to the city. There's trouble. Like recently, I've heard a lot of people talking about a recession. We've seen those before. That's trouble. That, that happens. You know, your, my family has no drama and never has, but I'm sure your family has lots <laughs> of drama and complications. <laughs> But, but that's real. And health issues, some of you are battling all kinds of stuff. I have loved ones battling health issues. There's work issues. Some of you really don't want to go back to work on Monday because of something. And so as Christians, we say, yes, God is good. And yes, God loves you and all those things. But these things stink, right? Some of these things, it's like they're really bad. And the psalmist is saying, this, this is not good. And so we hold this reality like in this hand. We say, no, this is really true. There is trouble. And then there's this thing on the other hand, it's the other reality, and we hold these intention, these two realities, and we often unfortunately forget this second reality. Because when you're in chaos or trouble, whatever, we don't forget that. It's like, oh, I forgot, I'm in chaos and trouble. You never forget that. But what we do forget is that God is always at work. This is not a feeling thing. I don't feel like, it's not about feelings. It's, it's the truth that God is always at work. And I love two main examples in Psalm 46. Verse 4. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. So just look at this one just for a second. And this has everything to do with being still, but it's going to take me a second to get there. He's talking about this river in God's city in Jerusalem that's under attack. Now here's what's interesting. If you've been to Jerusalem, there's no river there. So is, is the psalmist lying? No. Uh, it's a metaphor. There's this metaphor about this city that's kind of going crazy, and then there's this river that, that symbolizes uh, this continual outpouring or blessing of God. So think about it. Chaos in a city, and then there's this river that's bringing blessings to the city. That's who the psalmist is, how the psalmist is likening to God, right? And it's not only that this river is going to make this chaotic city glad, but the result is, I love this, she won't fall. Right? We call cities and boats she, but she won't fall. God is within her. So what does it say about God? God is protecting that city. God is helping that city. God is refreshing that city. God is sustaining that city. And if you've been with Hope for a while, does anyone remember that I've actually preached on this before? It was the first Sunday after Florence. 
And the city was devastated, and we were scared and not sure what's going on. And this verse kept coming up to me and was so encouraging. Is God is in this city, in this community. She will not fall. Okay, second example, verse 9. I love this one too. So these are both examples of God at work. It says that, um, like before verse 9, it talks about come see what God has done. And then verse 9 says, he makes wars cease. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He breaks those weapons of violence is is what he does. And so what the psalmist is saying about this, which is really important, is that the, the God we worship has brought peace, is bringing peace, and will bring peace. When you look at what God will do, this is called eschatology, in the time to come, he is establishing a kingdom of peace. So all the work that God does is to create peace both in us and around us and through us. You with me? That's what God's doing. That's how God uh, is at work. And so what I love about this is, um, is that in the midst of chaos that the psalmist is, is experiencing, he also knows that God is establishing a kingdom of peace. Now, what does the river, right, the river in the city, and what does God, the war stopper, have to do with being still? Everything. Um, because your stillness is connected to your knowing of God, right? That verse is, be still and know that I'm God. Those things are linked. Think about it. If you pause for a second, think how being still and knowing that God is God is linked. Now, talk about knowing for a second. To know God, in, in this context, in the Hebrew, is an acknowledging. And it's acknowledging that God is God. With your life, not just with your lips, you acknowledge God is God, you are not. God is in control, you are not. Right? So in the midst of chaos, this is what the psalmist is doing, saying God is God and that God is at work. And so what, what I love about the reality of the psalmist, sometimes people, when you meet people, they're like, everything's terrible and everything's terrible. Or on the other side, God is good, nothing's bad. And the psalmist says, oh, no, no, no. God is awesome. He's our refuge and strength. Holy smokes, there's some stuff happening. Mountains are falling into the sea, people. Both and, right? And we hold those uh, intentions. Now, I told you this at the beginning as I'm thinking about this. Telling Nate Stratman to be still has never worked, both physically and probably spiritually, like a command, be still. Because guess what it makes me do? Get more wiggly, right? Both physically and spiritually. You cannot tell me to be still. I struggle with that. But I want to tell you how to treat me because there's other people in your family and maybe you that are, that are like me. Don't tell me to be still, but remind me that God is is at work, right? Like a flourishing river in a city. I might not see it. I might not be aware of it, but God is at work in the city bringing blessings into the midst of chaos. Remind me that God is my refuge and strength, right? My ever-present help in trouble. Remind me of those things. And guess what happens? Those truths allow Nate Stratman's soul to be still. I always need a why. Don't tell me to do something without the why. When you tell me the truth of God, that's the why. And the result is to be still. Are you with me? We need a reason to be still. Like, it's not just about behavior, like, God really loves people who can sit still in church. That's no, 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 (laughs) no. When we can trust God that God is God, then the result of that is that we can be still even when poo-poo hits the fan, right, in our life. And so I love all these translations I've been reading this week, these different Bible translations of be still. And I think one of my favorite ones is enough. Like, stop it! (laughs) Enough! Uh, Another translation about be still is cease striving. Some of you are strivers. Strivers, strivers. I need my dad to approve, my boss to approve. I need God to think I'm great. And so we strive, 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 and says cease doing that. Um, Stop fighting. Stop panicking. All these different translations of be still. So what I think is that God is, is telling us probably to stop freaking out and trying to fix all the things that are not in our control anyways. I've had counselors tell me before, like when I worry about something, they'll say, is that yours? Well, it feels like it's mine. (laughs) Is that yours to control, to worry about that? No. Okay. On then, right? But we tend to want to control things that we can't even do anything about anyway. So if I learned anything and still learning in 2021, it's that God is at work even when Nate Stratman is not. I think I believe this lie. It was like, God does great things when Nate Stratman does great things. Um, But when I choose stillness in the Lord, more seems to get done, which is so weird for me to understand. 
But the more that I trust God and believe in the body of Christ and God using God's people and not try to do it all on my own, the more it actually gets done. So think about this. There are two things I want us to think about. The Christian or the church that lacks stillness or lacks knowing that God is God. So let's think about that real quick. For someone or a church that really doesn't believe that God is God or does not know how to be still and know that God is God, the, the thing I keep thinking about is if you are that person, you have joined the stampede. Um, and Eugene Peterson has talked about this before. There's an a, a English writer who talked about the stampede and basically says that nothing good comes from a stampede. Think about that. Any stampede you've ever seen or heard of, like, anything good come from that? It's just chaos. Um, one of the things I was thinking about is I was in Kenya at a, a famous park called Masai Mara, which is where the Maasai warriors live. And this place is, uh, one of the reasons it's famous is because it has the national, um, the annual migration of a stampede of wildebeest. And it's 1.5 million of them. And I happen to be like in this van thing with all these photographer type people and people from a mission called Compassion International. And the wildebeest would get all stirred up and they come down to this famous place called The Crossing, which you've seen on National Geographic where all the animals go across and the alligators are waiting on them. And, <laughs> but they come down and they go back and they come down and they go back. And what's really interesting when you think about a wildebeest is they're always nervous looking. Because right? they're, like, they're in the stampede and they're afraid, rightly so, and they trample their young because they're so nervous and they're noisy and they're dusty and they go down to the river to cross and then they, ch they, they chicken out. And I think as I've thought about that analogy about the stampede, American culture is a stampede culture in a lot of ways. Um, just think about Black Friday for a second. And I'm not trying to like be a buzzkill, but like I... There's nothing funny about the uh, Black Friday stuff that happens every year. Think about this. Every year, we hear of people dying in stores being stampeded so that someone else can get a deal on something that they probably didn't need. People screaming and cussing and yelling and all these things to clerks and to all this kind of stuff so that we can get the TV for the bonus room. That is a picture of this stampede culture that I think that we've kind of stepped into or that we've helped create in America. So think about that, like stampede of busyness. And so if you feel, and some of us feel this, the ground beneath you shake, metaphorically, it is the onslaught of the stampede. And what's so crazy is you think, not in the church. Church people are good at being still and knowing God has got, wait, man, we create more business than anyone else sometimes. And you can feel the stampede. And if you don't want to be trampled by the stampede, you must intentionally step out of the chaos in an act of defiance, which is prayer, which is Sabbath, which is solitude, right? Those are defiant acts in uh, American culture. And so I actually used to think that my busyness and striving really helped God. And I've come to realize that that's not true, that sometimes with my best efforts, I get in the way of what God's trying to do because they don't know how to be still and know that God is God. Now, think about a Christian or a church who is still before the Lord and who does know God and want to know that God is God. That person is confident, not arrogant, nothing worse than an arrogant Christian, confident, right? Confident in chaos. And that's what the psalmist, think how the psalm starts. He says, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, so the result of that confidence is, I will not fear, though the earth gives way. I love that. Not arrogance, confidence. And it's not only confidence, but it's this thing that leads to not being fearful. And so think about this, like if you kind of put it all together, as I was praying over this this week. Knowledge, when you know in the core of your soul that God is God, in at work today, right now, in the midst of whatever's happening in your life, that actually leads to less fear. And guess what happens? When you have less fear, that leads to stillness. Your soul can actually be still. This week I got a call from my mom that told me that my dad was rushed in the middle of the night to the ER with heart issues, was in the ICU. And when I got that call, I was shocked. Right? I didn't say, oh my God, God is good. No, I was like, oh no, that's terrible. But I wanna tell you something, I was not afraid Right? 
so even though like the earth goes into the sea and your dad gets rushed into the ER and all these types of things, I was not afraid. And here's the deal. Honestly, I was confident that God was a river of blessings present in that hospital protecting my family. I really believe that. And I was also, we talk about confidence, I was also confident in my dad's confidence in the Lord. My dad is a still, he, can, he is a be still person. Because he knows that God is God, regardless of, of the chaos. So, let's play this out. What's the worst thing that could have happened to my dad? He, he could have died the other day, as he was in the hospital for several days. But think about this. Death does not separate my dad from God, or from God's love. And so that's why I love when Paul says, it's almost like this taunting nanny nanny boo boo thing that Paul says about death. He says, where, O oh, death, is your victory? Like, you didn't win. Even though we die, you don't win, death. Where is your sting, right? You can't hurt us because we are eternally secure in, in Christ. And so think about all this stuff for a second. Can you all see how knowledge, like knowing that God is God and what God is up to, leads to confidence and to stillness? and to peace, and to eternal security. When we remember those things, we start to experience these gifts of the Spirit. Confidence in God and the ability to be still doesn't just happen by accident. Nate Straben isn't just naturally you know, confident in God and still. And so one of the things I want to ask you, some of you are brand new Christians, some of you are seasoned Christians, some of you don't even know where you are, that's fine, we're glad you're here. But I do have this question for all of us, especially the people who've been following God a long time and there might be a little cruise control thing going on. Do you have a plan this fall, let's say, for truly growing in your knowledge that God is God to deepen your trust and confidence and stillness? Do you have a plan, like if you have kids, do you have a plan for helping that happen for your kids? Um, a coworker, someone who would say that you're their pastor because you're the only Christian they know in your cubicle C3, you know? Do you have some kind of plan this fall where you're going to intentionally think, how do I grow in this knowing that God is God? Now, the church wants to help, but we're not going to do it for you, right? We want to walk alongside, because guess who's doing it, too? I'm doing that, too. I'm Right now, I'm thinking, in the fall, what am I going to do to say no to some things, to say yes to some things, because I need to deeper know that God is God and God is at work so that I can be still in the midst of chaos. And so I, I want you to kind of, I want to send you with these words of Jesus in the New Testament. And what Jesus says, and I alluded to it earlier, is just really similar to what the psalmist said in Psalm 46. Because Jesus talks about these two realities that are really true. Jesus says in John, he says, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. I love that. In Christ we have peace. We can try it all kinds of other ways, but in me you have peace. And then he says, in this world you will have trouble. Okay? Reality. You're going to have trouble. I'm never surprised when someone says, oh my gosh, we're, you know, we're having issues at the house. Okay. In this world, you will have trouble. But, greatest theological word in all of scripture, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Hold those two things in tension. Right now, life is really hard, but God has conquered evil, won against evil ultimately and in eternity. And so, yes, there is trouble, and yes, God is at work to establish a kingdom of peace, both in your heart and in our world. And so this psalm is this invitation for you to be still and to know that God is God and God is at work. And for some reason, I just have this feeling this morning that some of you have someone in your life that you need to remind that to. God is at work. You might not be able to see this, but I trust that God is like a river flowing in this place. Blessing, protecting, lifting up, nourishing. And so we're going to believe that for some people who have a hard time believing that. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, it is encouraging to know that when we look around and it seems like everything is turned upside down, politically, financially, I mean, all these things, but then to trust under the rubble and under the chaos and in the confusion, there is this river that brings nourishment and stability 
that God, you are a fortress of protection. And so, God, we have so many reasons to be confident. We're not going to act like there are troubles in this world. We're going to name them and be honest about them. But we're also going to be honest that you are at work in the midst of the troubles. So, God, give us the faith we need. Help our unbelief. For those today who are struggling to believe, help our unbelief to know that you are God and you're at work even when our emotions tell us something else. May our faith remind us that you're at work. And we pray this in the name of the Father God and the Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.